Back in Syria, before I came here to this camp, four years ago, I was at the college and, and I went to a poetry evening and there was a guest speaker and after the event ended, I spoke to him and I asked, please, can you, can you give me feedback on my poetry? So he read it, just a poem, and, and he said to me, my son, take care of yourself, you will become something. And that gave me the motivation to keep writing. It was a very simple love poem, and my friends at college saw it, and they started to photocopy it. We had a research paper one time, and one of my friends who wanted to play a prank, instead of presenting his research, he gave the professor my poem. And the professor, she started to read it out loud, and she started to laugh, reading and laughing, and, and when she reached the end, she saw my name and she said, is that, is that you? I was under the table. And I had a friend, uh, a female friend, yeah. And she said, why is the professor laughing? And she asked for a copy of my poem. Her father was from a very high up family and, and, in, and like, you know, not from, I mean, I'm from a very poor household. So she was talking to me and she started to be a little bit more interested in me. So I started to write poetry and, and we would sit together during the breaks and I would read to her the poetry aloud. And once she said, I want to ask you a question, but you have to be very honest when you answer this, okay? All this poetry that you've been writing, is it for me? I said, no, but I was not telling the truth because I was writing my poetry for her. I lied to her, yes, because I am realistic. I mean, who am I? I'm nothing, and she's from a very well-off family. But I'll be honest, I, I, had, a, I had some feelings for her. She, she used to, to write notes from the lectures that we were given, you know, and, and, uh, and one day I missed um, a lecture and I asked her for a copy of her notes. So she brought the lecture to me on an envelope and I, I didn't read it right away because it was, we were going to need it later. So I left the envelope she, she gave me and I put it in a drawer. And then the next day she became really cold towards me and she wouldn't even say hello. So you know, a month later, it was time for me to study. And I opened the envelope. She left for me with the lecture notes. And what I saw was in the first page, it was a love letter from her to me. She thought I had read it and I had ignored her completely. And I was shocked. I was so shocked I failed the exam. I asked my friend, what am I going to do with this now? What, what, what do you do? You know, what? and he told me, just go, go speak to her. And I said, no, I can't. I can't because we're graduating. We're from different worlds. And, <laughs> and she, she was walking with her friends. And I went up to her and I said, hello. Um, and she said, hello, in a very cold tone. And I said, can I speak to you for a moment? And she said, no. No, I, if you want to say something, say it in front of my girlfriends. I said, look, I can't have this conversation in front of them. You know, I have to speak with you alone. And she said, OK, OK. So we went to the side, you know, and I told her, look, you're from a very rich family and I'm from a poor family. It's not that I don't love you. I do love you, but I would never fit in with your friends or the world you belong to or your, your family. I have to go back to my town where people are depending on me. And you have to go back to your town. She was about to cry. And I told her, I didn't ignore the love letter you sent me. I just didn't see it. And most of the time, I let my mind rule, you know? But sometimes the mind can't function and it's the heart that takes over. Some things belong to the heart.